Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Rebuild with Confidence Divorce Summit. I'm your host, Lisa Grace, and I'm thrilled that you are listening to this interview today. You're in for a treat. My featured guest today is a man who truly understands how a divorce should be handled. But before we dive in, I want to take a moment and share a bit about my own personal journey. You see, like many of you listening, I've experienced the pain and challenges of divorce firsthand. Looking back, I realized there were mistakes I made that could have been avoided. I wish I had the incredible help that is available today. But now, it's time for a fresh start, a chance to rewrite our stories and rebuild with confidence. And here to guide us on this transformative journey is an exceptional individual. Our special guest today is Tom Sturgis. Tom is an accomplished author, music executive, mentor, and captivating speaker. His remarkable career has seen him working alongside renowned artists such as Smashing Pumpkin, 50 Cent, and Outkast. Quite the impressive list, isn't it? You can discover more about Tom and his incredible body of work at TomSturgis.net, where you will find a treasure trove of his other enlightening books. But today, Tom is here to share his invaluable insights on his latest masterpiece, A Good Divorce Begins Here. Brace yourself, my friends because what you're about to hear has the power to transform your entire journey. So without further ado, let's extend a warm welcome to the one and only Tom Sturgis. Welcome, welcome, Tom. Thank you, Lisa. I so appreciate you having me be part of your summit. It means a great deal to me. Can I hold it up now? Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. There it is. I chose hopeful colors. Because yeah. I'm, it's all about hope when you go through one of these. They are. And, you know, I love your book. I love your audio version of your book as well, because w- you are narrating it. Yeah. And so you have such a way of presenting the ideas in a very comforting, soothing manner um, that when I started listening to it, I was hooked to the very end and you, I, I will stop there, but everyone <laughs> needs to listen to your book. Um, it's also, I'm gonna make a note here. It's also to me a, a manual of sorts in that it almost should be required reading when your divorce is going, re- when your marriage is going really well, you're not even thinking of divorce but that it plants the seeds on how to do life well and continue to do it well. So I will, I will put that in there. So Tom, could you tell us what inspired you to write your book, a good divorce begins here and who do you hope it helps? Well, well, first, thank you for the beautiful introduction and uh, uh, the uh, creation of my bio. And thank you for all those compliments. I so appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, so divorce is this taboo subject. The last thing people want to talk about is divorce. It's, I remember I gave somebody my business card and it had the artwork for the book on it. And the guy's wife was looking through his wallet for something, found my card and came in and started waking him up. She's like, do we have something to talk about? Because it's just such a, it's just such a, a word fraught with tension and danger. And almost everybody I had met, including my my mom and my dad, who together had seven marriages, um, the divorce was always like the worst part. It was like this crater in their life that they were climbing out of for the rest of their lives. And um, when I and it came to me, it was like a complete surprise. Suddenly, I was getting a divorce. I had sworn I was never going to get divorced, but you know, life happens. Life is what happens. Um, And one day I find myself in the middle of a divorce, but I still love my ex. I love her family. I love our kids. I love where we live. I love the whole thing. It's just that we weren't supposed to be married any longer. And the first thing I had to do was accept that that was a fact and a reality, just as if I had had a leg cut off in a car accident or something. It was just... This is the new reality. You can talk about the leg you used to have, or you can figure out how to 
work with a prosthetic. And so I was keeping track of all the issues that we were facing. And I knew I was going to, I didn't want to not love her or be mad at my kids. And I didn't want it to be her friends and my friends. I wanted to keep everybody's friends. So I arrived at this concept that there are three vitally important uh, factors that have to go into a divorce if it's going to work out. And I feel like a scientist who, who went into the lab every day and proved his theory and proved his theory. And it is a good theory and it is true and it does work. Kindness, respect, generosity. Those are the fundamental pillars to me of a, of a, a way through the, the incredibly difficult transition of a divorce. You show your ex kindness in every call. If you get upset, you whisper. If you hear an argument starting, you say, hey, I got to go. We'll talk later. And you get off the phone and you don't let it. You don't let anything awful get into you. Respect. You respect your ex for all that he or she was and, and represented in your life. You were terribly in love with this person once. You committed to a future together and maybe children together and making each other wealthy and keeping each other healthy and maybe even burying a few people along the way. But you've been through so much. So you have to respect what that was in your life then and what that represents in your life going forward. And then generosity, you have to be generous, both sides, you have to be generous emotionally, you have to be generous with your time, you have to be generous with your listening, and you have to be generous with your funding, you got to get you get somebody's not going to like how much money changes hands. But that's part of the game, you got to do that, close your eyes, write the check, and be gone. So um, what inspired me to finally write the book is that I was successful in this regard. And uh, I tried these things. So it's like the, the book, if you read an earlier draft, was theories. But by the time this book is written, it's all it's proven. And my ex-wife and I, we speak oh, every God. morning, every morning. Uh, I went to her wedding. Um, I have dinner at her house anytime I want. She and my sons live a couple of blocks away. They, we bump into each other at the Vons. So, and there's never an issue. I, I root for her. I cheer for her. I counsel her on her business. Um, uh, her husband uh, is, is a pal of mine. I see them because we go, my wife and I go up for Christmas dinner every Christmas with them. So it's not that the divorce ended a relationship. It uh, adjusted the relationship. And I know, Lisa, you were... Uh, uh, you were you and I were talking about this previously um, is that the relationship uh, it morphed it developed it had to go somewhere because we were no longer husband and wife so where does it go where do you allow it to go and for myself I chose the next best thing which is siblings mm. and I let my wife become my kid sister become I'd looked at her instead of, oh, this is my ex-wife and I remember owning that car and I remember when this was my kitchen and all that other nonsense, I let that all go. And I rooted for her as I would with a kid sister in everything. And so that means she shares, uh, she comes to me for advice and counsel, which I only give when asked. This is a critical piece. I only give my thoughts when I have been requested to give my thoughts. Other than that, it's your kid sister. Why do you care? You let her have her life. I have my life. Two blocks apart. Um, I have a question. How is that relationship benefited your children? Uh, if my kids adore me and the fact that there was never a harsh word between my, uh, their mother and me. There was never a slam door. Mm -hmm. Might have been one or two slam phones. Uh, I'm not perfect. I might have, might have, but it was me saying, hey, I, I hear an argument coming, so I'm going to go now. Talk to you later. But not this or, you know, I, I write in the book about a guy I met and I was telling him I'm working on a 
divorce, a book about a good divorce. He says, wow, I wish my father had had that book. And it turned out that his father had been calling his mother that woman for 30 years. He's walking down the beach with his children, that man's grandchildren, and the mother is still that woman. And I mean, what a waste. What a waste. Yeah. My children love the fact that the family didn't get uh, destroyed by the divorce. It just got bigger. She got married. I got married. I have another child. Uh, it's, it's just bigger. Now it's like a compound instead of a single family house. Well, that modern family, that movie, you know, that show, everybody yeah. is, uh, I really think that um, there's so much room for positivity. And I think everyone thinks you have to do divorce poorly and, and you don't. Well, that's the template that's out there, right? Yeah. And that's because that word is such is. It, it's such a terrible word on the one hand, um, and so many people have gruesome stories that go along with it. But my uh, statement to your viewers and your readers is that even if you had a bad divorce, you can still have a good divorce. You can uh, adopt some of the concepts that I'm trying to bring forward here and just let this let this change you a little bit. Not the whole of you, just a little bit. Put down the sword if you're still fighting with your ex and it's 10 years later. Just stop. Enough. It doesn't have to be that way. If you want to be angry every morning and grit your teeth down to nubs, good luck. That's who, that's who you want to be and that's who you will be. But if you want peace in your life and you want to be able to go to the soccer game and watch the kids and, and say hi to your ex's new person, whoever that might be, it's up to you. It's up to you. A good divorce, it can happen. And even if you had a bad one, you can turn it into a good one. So you chose early on not to place blame and or not to take on the role of victim. You never, never have been a victim. And, and I've had some, we were talking about this. My uh, last time I saw my dad, I was one. He died when I was three. Some guys would make that their cross. They would carry throughout their lives. It never was for me. I don't play. I don't play victim very well. I had to accept what was happening. And to me, the philosophy that I use and I utilize and I rely on is that life is what happens. You're sitting at your house. The doctor calls and says, "You just had a bad blood test. You need to get down here." That's what just happened. That's what you have to react to. You can't bemoan what you did or didn't do that got you to that moment. That is your moment. The doctor just called, go to the office. Or your wife calls and says, I'm not happy anymore. And I need to make a change. It's life, baby. It just happened to you. And what are you going to do with that? For me, once I accepted it, I'm not saying I accepted it in 10 minutes. I mean, it, it was I put up a big fight and we tried and we talked and wasn't a there there anymore you know both people have to be in love and i move forward without blaming without rancor without anger and these three things came into my head kindness respect and of course generosity generosity being very generous and for us i don't mind the world knowing um i figured out on this on this column all the money i would owe is the as the the winner of the lion's share for spousal support and child support and half a college and everything else and that ended up being a number on the other side were all the assets of the marriage and that was a different number so i attract i subtracted this one from this one and i didn't i wrote one check and by generous, my wife was a very artistic and creative person who created a lot of royalty streams. I did not ask for a penny of her royalties. That was the generosity. You created it. You, you brought those things into the world. Those are yours. Not for me. And we've never, ever had an argument about money. We've never had to ask for a check or that was unfair. Nothing. The money was just this generous, beautiful package. Off you go. Um, 
you write in your book so many horror stories, uh, you know, about how people did it wrong. I just applaud you, Tom, for having just having the fortitude to have that generous, respectful, um, kindness spirit about you. That's why I mentioned before we got on this call that, and we mentioned it here, divorce is such a, it comes with such a bad rap, but it doesn't have to be. No, it can just, if you don't, if you want your marriage to end, it can just end. Yeah. It's up, it's up to you and your partner. You can go, Hey, can we just end this nicely? Right. You get to move on with your life. I'll move on with my mm -hmm. life. We won't, we won't be at each other's throats. Let's stay friends. Let's, we did so many things together. And in most marriages, if you look back, there's so many great events, whether it's the, the courtship or the romance or the wedding or the first child or buying your first house. I mean, all these, these uh, thresholds that, that you cross to get to this moment, you're going to burn all those just because he or she or they may have fallen in love with somebody who wasn't you. Really? All that gets tossed asunder as opposed to, okay, I, I am going to embrace this too. Fine. This life is just, life just happened. I'm getting a divorce. I know that uh, we, we, we get stuck. I'm talking me. Um, and some people I've met across my lifetime, we get uh, stuck behind how it, other people are going to view us that we went through the divorce. You know, they're going to think less of us. But right. in all reality, when I separated, got divorced from my husband, um, and I had my first little apartment, and I, and I got to come home to peace and well-being i got to decorate it the way i wanted to decorate it i mean in all reality i was so much happier because we wow. had lost something along the way wow and and i started finding joy and i started finding fitness and i started because i had given up my identity i think that's what a lot of us do we start giving up our identity um and that's probably what attracted you to each other and to begin with. I so agree. You make a good point, which is that uh, a divorce is not a failure. That marriage stopped working, but that doesn't mean the marriage was a failure. It just stopped working. Right. Some people are really lucky. Uh, my mother and father-in-law, uh, 55 years together, 55 years together. Uh, I'm not going to live long enough to ha let that happen to me or have that happen to me. Um, but I don't see the divorce as a failure. I, I see the divorce as a milestone, uh, uh, a time for change is more of, of what it was for me. It's not, it, I, it, cause somebody actually said to me, I wrote about it in the book, they said, Oh, I'm so sorry. Your marriage failed. I was like, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. We were to together almost 20 years, two amazing kids. We bought and sold four houses, made millions of dollars, helped each other's careers tremendously, and we're parting as friends. What's the failure? Which is really the question you got to ask yourself. There's no failure. There's no, there's no stigma to not staying married, you know, to one person your whole life. It's if you tried and you gave it your best and you gave it your everything and it didn't work, then this is a, a, a super important step that you have to take that allows you to move forward with your life, not damaged. You still have your wings. You still have your heart. You still have your, your spirit and your dreams. It takes nothing from you. Maybe you got to write a check. Okay. Write a check. You'll make more money, but allow the, allow the world to, to survive you and have you survive it as you go, okay, I gave it my everything and it didn't quite happen. You Off we go. Hope. We'll try again. You give hope. And, and that's what I like about your book to name just a couple, which I could give 20. Um, you start out your book <laughs> with um, give it your all to make the marriage work. 
Yeah, so but you got to give everything. I mean, flat out, give it everything. Turn over every stone, do whatever it takes, and then, and so that's very encouraging. You have to. You. It will only be a good divorce if you gave the marriage every chance. Correct. You have to give it every chance and say everything that's on your mind. And if you have a hurt feeling or you have a question or get it all out there so that there's no holding back. You're not prepping for a divorce. You're, um, and, and obviously you have to be faithful. Uh, obviously you have to be truthful with your spouse. And if you're not in love anymore, you have to say, I'm so, so sorry. I know this is one I promised, but I'm not in love with you anymore. And I write one of the chapters that we'll do in our podcast, Lisa, is that how you break up is so, so important. You, you just, how you handle that moment, because that's a moment that the other person will remember for the rest of their lives. And if you make it awful, it will be an awful memory, but suppose you don't. Suppose so a top movie director yes. <laughs> was saying goodbye to a girlfriend and yes. that her I, the farewell was a beautiful dinner and a gift card and uh, a whole day at Rodeo Drive to outfit and luggage and shoes and everything. So kind of that was, like, it sounds like pretty woman a tiny bit. You know, it's, it's partly there that those stories mix in. Yes. Yeah, I bet they do. I bet they do. Uh, what, so, uh, so some of the mistakes, um, and we're kind of alluding to them right now, but um, I have kind of two questions in one here. Okay. So it's been my experience that uh, people gaslight their spouse and say, I've been contemplating this divorce for the last 10 years. And you mentioned that, you know, that the first sign that you're not happy is when you should start bringing it up. And then also to not have the affair, like don't be over in Europe um, in bed deciding that you're going to, you know, and so, so many people don't do that. People stray before they're divorced. And that's what makes a good divorce hard. No, it's. I, I think it makes it almost impossible if you have, if you have started your next life while your spouse is still in this life. Um, somebody's not going to forgive somebody for a long, long time. And I tell the story in the book of a guy who decided he was going to get a divorce while he was in bed with his girlfriend in another country, and his wife hacked open his computer and found everything. Every email, the setting up of a bank account, the rewriting of the will, and she went after this guy bad, bad. And he stood before the judge, a liar and a thief and a cheat. And uh, the, I, I still don't think they speak because it was such a betrayal. It can't be a betrayal. You can, you get to be unhappy in a marriage. You get that's. That's part of the deal, because who? what two people are always going to be happy together? You get to have a little unhappiness. You try and work it out. If your salve for the unhappiness is another relationship, then you have betrayed yourself and your promise to your spouse. And that will not be a good divorce. I promise. It's just because there's no there's no room for it to be a good divorce. So if you sense that you're unhappy or you're uncomfortable or you know, your neighbor's always hanging out at your house. You're like, what are you doing here? You know, then <laughs> and you go, hey, hold on. What's going? Let's talk. Let's have our conversation. And, you know, try and try it with all you got to have a good divorce, respect, kindness, generosity. And so in your bio, if, you're a mentor. You, you mentioned that you like to. You, so this book and I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. Okay. Um, the uh, I feel like this book is a book that you could place in one of your buddies' laps. That says, "Read this before you move forward. Do not, do not proceed. Stop. Pause. Read this so that you don't end up with ruining your family, your wife, your children, all of that." Did you have any of that in mind as like being? And, you know, you're an advisor to your buddies. I've had several friends now who have used this book to end, help end their marriages. Okay. 
and um, they are incredibly thankful because they didn't. It, it's like somebody saying, "Hey, there's a there's a bridge out up ahead, so don't go fast over that bridge. Just take this other route." And the guy goes, "No, I got this," and drives over the bridge and into the canyon. It's a fiery mess, but the person who goes this other way takes a little more time, a little more circuitous route. That person has has the better time. But it's the th those three words. I'm not going to repeat them. But that, yeah. that's how you have to. That's what the that's going to be the best of you as you go into it. Even if it's just at the very beginning, and you're like, "Honey, I'm not happy. Why? Uh, this isn't working for me. Can can we adjust? Can we?" And if you see if you can, because you two, you husband and wife, made a promise. We're going to do everything we can to make this work. And sometimes that includes an awkward conversation and somebody saying, you hurt my feelings and uh, or you keep taking these trips and I'm and I'm forgetting what you look like when you come home. You, you have to be able to speak from your heart. In the same way when you were just dating and just sharing love stories and incredible evenings and imagine that oh, the beauty of the honeymoon and, and all those things, you had that experience. That gives you the right to say something's not perfect here and we need to, we need to talk about it, as awkward as that can be. But that's what I said. You have to give it your everything and then the t both of you will realize that the marriage is ending. Not one person, you know, five miles down the road already building a new house and, uh, you know, picking their, you know, picking kids up at school. Yeah. So, yeah, no, thank you. Because that's just human kindness and that having that leading, leading by that just saves so many hearts. It saves children. It saves family. It saves in-laws, outlaws, friends. <laughs> you know, it just, it just makes it such a better place because I'm still friends with, I mean, I still call my ex mother-in-law, my mother-in-law mm -hmm. and, you know, as do, as do I Lisa. Yeah. And I still send her, um, mother day cards and, you know, she's very special to me and she's my daughter's grandmother. And I so took my ex mother-in-law to the dentist on Friday mm. and my son who's uh, from my new marriage, who's not related to her at all, has a pet name for her. So it's just all part of this. It's it's a it's this beautiful family that just got a little a little bigger as a result of our divorce. Not small. Wonderful, and and we you know you cannot ever have too much love ever right. never never never. So thank you, Tom. What other books have you written um, that you'd like to mention? Maybe something around parenting. Uh, <laughs> Where is my book? Let me see. Uh, this is a book I wrote. This is a really wonderful book. This is called Parking Lot Rules and 75 Other Ideas for Raising Amazing Children. And the concept of this book, uh, you'll hear a familiar word. Uh, the concept of this is if you show your children complete respect every day of their lives, they will grow up respecting themselves mm. and the world around them. If that's the if that's the tenor of every conversation is respect. So and there's there and this is a, a lot of little ways to show your the little people in your life respect. Uh, for instance, uh, when you get upset, whisper so that you're never your child never hears an angry voice. Right? Um, there's a statistic out that more kids quit sports because of the ride home from the game oh, wow. than any other reason, right? And that's dad angry, driving too fast, jawing at the son or daughter for not hustling or not getting enough goals or whatever it is. That is such a horrendous moment for that child and such a disrespectful moment, especially if it's in front of the wife and the and other kids. So I came up with a rule called game day next day. And on the day of the game, your kid is your hero, right? And you compliment them and, hey, you really tried. I see you. I saw you trying. And then at breakfast the next day, you go, okay, let's talk about your hustle, right? So that they get the day to feel great and enjoy themselves and be happy with who they are. And then the next day, they can start making corrections. 
So that's the concept, uh, parking lot rules uh, uh, like that. My favorite book, I wonder if I have it right in front of me here. Hold on. Well, I wrote my book on creativity. Yeah, I don't have it right in front of me. But I wrote a beautiful book on creative people and what they do to achieve their greatest creativity. Oh. And it's a profile on 30 different songwriters who I became uh, close to or had close enough to observe, including Carol King, mm -hmm. uh, Diane Warren, Sir George Martin, uh, who told me about the early Beatles, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dre, um, Paul Simon. And each of them, oddly enough, had a completely different way of uh, achieving their creative strength. And what I do in the book, it's like a, a like a toolbox mm -hmm. of here is all that these people did. I'll give you a very simple one. Um, so uh, Carol King is open to creative input. And I know this because I worked with her when I was just starting out. I had no hits. I had no portfolio. I had no nothing. All I had was her phone number. And I reached out and said, are you working on anything? And can we work together? And next thing you know, I was I got to be her music publisher for a couple of years. And she was open if I had an idea about a song, which was amazing to me that she probably one of the greatest songwriters in the history of songwriting. Mm -hmm. If I said, hey, could I offer a thought on that uh, bridge? She would go, sure. Right. So that as one example, Diane Warren is another example. Every morning except Sunday, she's at her piano at 830 with a cup of coffee, ready to go. Wow. Has trained her intellect. Mm -hmm. We're going at 830, kids, everybody ready and boom. And then whatever comes out is the start of her creative day. Just two examples. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful, both those books sound like wonderful books. So Tom, how can... Um, they find these books. How can they find the book on divorce? Um, a good divorce begins here. How can our audience find your book? Uh, Amazon books uh, and anywhere, uh, anywhere on the internet, you can find the book. Uh, and also through my website, tomsturgis.net, where you can read uh, reviews of my books. And you can, they, if somebody wants to communicate with me, there's a way to reach me. Uh, uh, there's a way to reach me there uh, where it's like find Tom. And also for the 0.001% of your audience who knows who my dad is, there is a website devoted to my dad within my website. So that's who your dad is. My father is a screenwriter and director named Preston Sturgis, uh, who, uh, who was uh, famous and I think is my Oscar. Yeah, there's his Oscars right there. Wow. Uh, he is famous for being the first screenwriter to direct his own script. So the first time it ever said written and directed by, and there was one name, it was his. Wow, wow, that's awesome. How, in what here's year? A, here's the book and I wrote a book about him. That book. That's that book. Okay, I've seen that cover. All right. Yes, that's his self, that's a self portrait he did. Okay. Uh, one night, and I thought, well, nothing says more about you than your self portraits. So, I so Lisa, that. are we wrapping up? We are, and I can't thank you enough for being here today. And I'm so glad that you were able to share about your book. And I look forward to working with you in the future. And to the audience, thank you for being here. I think that you've been very blessed. <laughs> So I also want to say to you, Lisa, I think I love the path that you're on. I love the journey you're taking and your giving heart is on full display as you do things like this, because your hope is that somewhere out there in the world, a person who really would love to end their marriage nicely or go back and fix the one that didn't end nicely will hear the music that you're playing and and go, OK. I can, I, it doesn't have to be this tragedy I'm carrying around. I, I, I can, I can fix this and get it right. So uh, I salute you and your pursuit of your big dream to make the world a better place by helping people have better divorces. Thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate you. 
I'm going to end our recording and we'll stay on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining the Rebuild with Confidence Divorce Summit. I appreciate your participation and I'm proud of you for leaning in to your healing journey. If you're ready to take the next step towards rebuilding with confidence, book a discovery call with me at secondactcoaching.com. Together, we'll uncover the strategies and resources to help you start the rebuilding process and create a life you are excited about. Remember, you are not alone. We're here to support you every step of the way. Take care, my friend. And remember, there's always hope for a brighter future. And... The best is yet to come.